Navigating through life with a traumatic past can affect you in ways you never even realized. But for one man, having a yellow lab as his co-pilot changed everything. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. Welcome to The Long Leash. We went back to our archives to bring you a conversation with a celebrated author, writer, and producer. An exile from corporate America, Ward Serrell found himself in the untamed Alaskan wilderness, fighting the demons of an abusive childhood. He was seeking solitude to discover himself, but he did not do it alone. His dog, a beautiful Labrador named Woody, helped Ward look inwards and gave him the courage to understand his past and to change his future. Stay tuned after our conversation with Ward for an update on what he's doing today. Ward Cyril, thank you so much for being with us. Jim, it's uh, terrific. What an honor to be here with um, you and the world of the dog casts that you do around the world. Well, I love it. I think both of us have been very much impacted in our lives and our creative work by the role of a dog. Completely. To the extent that you wrote a book recently about Woody, who was your muse. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you bet. Well, Woody was a yellow Labrador. And so during the seven most transformative years of my life, which was up in Alaska. Um, He was my co-pilot. So I eventually wrote a book about it. It's an adventure story of of an exile from corporate America who uh, went to Alaska seeking a fierce freedom. And it's a story of self-discovery with one of life's essential relationships, you know, a man and a dog as as its core. So I think really it's a it's a f- book about the search for freedom in the wilds of Alaska with dog as a co-pilot into solitude to discover oneself. What year did this start? When did you This was all begin? um very early 80s. I was a three-piece suited accountant writing the elevators in downtown Seattle. I called it Boxtown um in my early 20s. No idea how I got there and you know, it would be decades before I realized the, you know, the trauma base of what had put me there. But at the time I was just riding elevators in a three-piece suit, you know, being an accountant. And one day I heard at this meeting, one of the partners say this word, Alaska, and something moved in me. I remember just raising my, he was, the partner was talking about these native village corporations up in these remote towns in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand and said, you know, I'll take every one of those. And so there I was with my audit bags on the back deck of the Alaska State Ferry going up to So were you working for a CPA firm, like a big CPA firm that had clients everywhere, including Alaska? That's right. Yeah. It was back in the, you know, I think there's now the big four, they call them. Back then, there was the big eight, you know, accounting firms. So it was one of those, right? And so had these clients up in Alaska, and so there I was going up to these remote villages with, as you say, the audit bag or, or those those big yeah. bags. <laughs> oh, that, absolutely. That, so you so just to even get to one of those big eight firms, you would have been selected and groomed in in college, and there was a competitive process and go through the training and all of that, right? In order to to get that CPA. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you that's right. You have business school, and then you're. You, you know, it's kind of pretty competitive to get into those things right. and you have to pass the CPA exam and all that yeah. business. So, you know, it's kind of a slot car track kind of a approach. Well, was that a natural place? I mean, did you, did, w- <laughs> did, w- I understand now clearly you look at it and say, wow, that was a different thing. But at that point, was it pretty congruent? Were you, you know, did you go to high school and college and, and like know that I'm on the track to go work in finance? accounting. It's congruent in the sense of being in a fractured state of, of existence, Mm. you know, I'll say, and less abstractly, you know, yeah, I was following the line of where my culture was leading me and I was making choices along the way, but I certainly could not have told you at the time 
what I was doing in a suit, really, <laughs> other than, oh, it's a good opportunities or this or that. But it was as foreign to me as, as you know, it could be to, you know, take a wolf out of the wilds and say, be a dog. Mm. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a pretty strange thing to do that. Yeah. What did people in your family and your friends say when you decided to go off to Alaska? Well, it sounded like a great adventure. And again, early 20s, you can, you know, launch out on just about anything. So, you know, most of my friends were around that age. Um, the other thing is I just left um, and I wasn't that interested in being understood at the time. So it was a taken off and time to, you know, step out of my culture and the force field of my family that had brought me to that point. Okay. So you land in Alaska. And does your life quickly devolve or evolve, depending upon your perspective, in terms of what you had come to do and what you ended up doing? So I start, I, you know, wake up in Alaska with 850 bucks in, to my name in this, the uh, birth of a, of a sailboat, you know, bouncing away in the, in Bar Harbor in Ketchikan, yeah. Alaska. And that's where I decided to make my stand. And in the crook of my arm was uh, when I woke up in the frozen berth of the sailboat one morning was this, you know, 12 week old yellow Labrador puppy um, that I named Woody after Woody Guthrie. And that was the beginning. And there I was in a place with, you know, 13 feet of rain a year on an isolated island, 18 hours of darkness in the winter, what is it, 27 bars and 26 churches all along one stretch of 33-mile road. You know, it was a pretty strange place to be. How did Woody find you? I mean, literally, is, is, is that poetic? Or li you woke up one day and there was this dog nuzzling with you? No, I when I decided to leave Boxtown and go to Alaska, I realized I needed a co-pilot. I needed okay. a companion. So I looked in the Seattle Times and saw this ad and it, it said, uh, attention hunters, AKC registered yellow Labrador, you know, championship stock and all this stuff. I didn't even know what any of that meant. I had never touched a gun or anything, but so I went out to the guy's place and, you know, pretended that, you know, I wanted, needed a hunting dog. And he said, okay, the only thing is he had, I think, nine puppies. And he said, you can choose any one of these except the pick of the litter. I didn't even know what that term meant at the time. And so, you know, I was wandering around and there was this one dog that, that you know, separated himself from the pack and was nosing around my feet. I picked him up and I remember I was reading in this, you know, how to get a puppy book, you know, and it said, look at his paws and check his teeth. And I was doing all this stuff, acting like I knew what, I wanted to do. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. And he said, well, that's the pick of the litter. That's <laughs> the one you can't have. And the moment the guy said that, that became my, you know, prime directive was to, you know, get out of there with that dog. So I, I eventually did. And that's who I took to Alaska. Okay. So you, you chose Woody, uh, literally from a litter in, in Seattle and you brought him up to Alaska. Yeah. But I'd get, I'd get, I just a little, you know, a little bit of nuance there. And, you know, one of those stories is that was the one dog that came over to me. So did I pick him? Did he pick me? I mean, you know, but yeah, you know, we chose each other. Was he the first dog you ever had? Yeah. And you had, growing up, you never had a dog. Did you? Oh, we had some dog. I'm sorry. Yeah, we had some dogs in the, in the household. They were always little dogs that I could always outrun, you know, dachshunds and, <laughs> and like that. And, and they just, you know, they, they just weren't a kid's dog mm -hmm. um, for a kid who grew up kind of really in the woods of Alabama. Um, so I kind of ignored them. I had an imaginary dog named Oreo that I my child mind created to overcome the trauma of the household I was living in. Um, but Woody was my first dog that was mine that I committed to. That you chose. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Oreo. When did Oreo come <laughs> into your life? When did you invent Oreo? So I was uh, uh, right around age six and seven. And so I was living in Huntsville, Alabama. And Really, my origins were um, on 
both sides. I'll just speak about it directly. The, the, the kind of primal woundings that I came in on is my mo- mother tried to commit suicide when I was in the womb, when um, she was birthing me and wanting to birth me, not wanting to birth me. And then after birth, I wasn't touched as an infant. She couldn't express physical love. And, and so I was on one side, grew up as a creature without human touch. Mm. Um, secondly, my father was an alcoholic. And so as a child, you just, you know, you kind of think this is how it is, you know, and you adjust to it. So anyway, I was smoking cigarettes at age six, uh, seven. I was climbing out on my back uh, roof of my house in Alabama and I'd sit there and the fireflies would come out and that would be the signal to me when my companion would come. Um, and he would come all reliably black and white and with wings. And it was this dog, imaginary dog, um, named Oreo. And his thing was, he was going to take me away from all this. And so I would climb on his back and fly out through the woods, you know? And so that was Oreo and that's where he that was. Okay. So Oreo, so you had the dachshunds, you had Oreo, who is your imaginary <laughs> black and white dog with wings. Yeah, therapy and then dog. there you are in your mid twenties, I guess, when you went up. To yeah. Early, ar- early twenties. I'd say early. Ad, yeah. Early twenties. You, you select this dog, name it after Woody Guthrie. You find yourself in Alaska, but what was the thing you said you knew you needed a co-pilot? So it seems to me that there's this impulse that has been driving you for a while without getting like into psych- being a psychologist that you kind of understood that a dog was going to be a guiding force for you. Absolutely, because the the mission was not to just go to Alaska, but was to explore solitude. I wanted to get away from my culture and society. So I started looking for um, places way out of town and found an abandoned cabin 13 miles out of town um, without um, insulation, running water, um, outhouse, out back, you know, on the, on the water. And, you know, I, I thought that was, you know, I thought it was a palace, you know, not realizing that, <laughs> there'd be wind chill of 25 below in the winters and um, that I'd have to use an ice scraper to scrape the ice off on the inside. But it was really clear to me, I couldn't do that. I didn't have the courage to do that without a dog. And Mm. that's the main thing. I think that's his first thing he gave me. Now, did you get the sense that as a puppy, he knew his responsibility to, to sort of be a therapist for you? Yeah, it's pretty fascinating about that. I, I I don't know other than he was a completely and the first completely unneurotic creature I had ever encountered in my life. And he was raised with care and, you know, he had his litter mates and the whole thing and just absolutely free of artifice and had that bloodline of Labrador retriever who was basically allowed to grow up in Alaska. And he became this beacon of healthy creaturehood. And I think that I started to see in him, he started to mirror that to me. And I think that's when I started to consider what this mirror was. And to me, it was, wow, that's a healthy creature over there. And I started to watch how he's responding to the to the world and exploring the world and, and with this confidence and and realized I'm not there. There's things in me that are not over there. And what are those things? And so yeah. that began, you know, in the journey to solitude, it begins as an outward facing journey. Mm-hmm. And if you hang in there a while, it becomes an inward facing journey. So that began the beginnings of the understandings, how my origins might have affected me. It seems that there was this guiding force throughout your life from the days of Oreo to the days of getting Woody that you knew in your soul that a dog will help be my guidepost. And then you started to observe these things in Woody in terms of, you know, following a natural path. Was this something that you would sit and deeply think about and appreciate at the moment? Or is this something that you kind of got to appreciate in retrospect? So I would say I became really a student of the solitude mm-hmm. of what this was. And 
I started to look and at these, you know, blockages that I would find in me or these, these places that were frozen that, you know, within me in my heart, if you will, and began to consciously look at those and, and more and more found that I wanted to get away from people and just be with the wilds and be with the, the dog. And that became a, ultimately a rite of passage that was a multi-year one. So how many years? And the book covers um, seven years of this journey. Okay. And those were the seven years that you were in Alaska? Yes. There was actually more years. I, I would say there's more years than that. Those were the most pregnant years of being with Woody there. Mm-hmm. And in the book, you obviously talk about these these different adventures and these different snapshots of evolution that occurred thanks to Woody. Uh, for our listeners, what are a couple that we want to talk about here? Let me start with this one. I, I think the primary thing that he brought to me was, I, I think he had you know, one commandment in his dog Bible, which was, you know, go outside. And here I was, you know, in a 13 feet of rain and the darkness, and it didn't matter to him. And it, his, his capacity for adventure took me out all the time. And that was a major part of me learning to come into my own creaturehood more mm-hmm. uh, in my own body. I think that's it. And I think that second thing that I just ended with is also true, is that that was the first time in my life I had really been around touch Mm -hmm. of another creature and being in cabins with this dog and just having physical touch with another creature, what is vulnerable as that sounds to say is absolutely true. And so that was revelatory. And so I could feel my nervous system start to regulate around like, oh, this is what it's like to actually be a social animal, you know, a little just to have touch with another creature that's breathing, you know. And then I would say he also taught me to find places in me that were cranky, or disturbed. And I'll say there was a lot of anger in me and that I started to touch into that. I didn't know what its source was or why. I just knew there was a lot. And I also, at the same time, let him be a free dog. I was pursuing freedom, so didn't seem right to keep him cooped up. So he could come and go as he wanted Mm -hmm. from the little red cabin where we were. And sometimes he would stay out longer and longer, and I would sometimes get mad about that. Try to, you know, bang it so he'd, you know, stay closer. Don't do that. You're, you're worrying dad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. But um, once things grew so that, um, well, the, the process grew, so I'd start to hit him a little bit, swat him on his butt kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And then eventually he took off for the longest time. And when he got back, I had been boiling for like three hours, this mm. anger in me, you know, and I, I'm not very proud of what happened next, but, you know, I ripped open the, the door of the cabin and I pulled him in and I pushed him down and I started to hit him on his rump and yell at him to not, you know, run away, don't do this. And then I had this sense that I wasn't having enough impact. And I picked up a piece of kindling from the wood pile. And as I um, raised it, I suddenly saw what was happening. I was appalled. And I looked into his eyes and he was looking at me just with eyes of complete uh, acceptance and no blame and just taking the hits. And I just crumbled, you know. I uh I dropped that stick and I um you know, I lay down with him. I um uh, <laughs> in the floor of the cabin and I just held him and I apologized <laughs> and said that I would never hit him ever again. And I didn't for the rest of our time. And that was a moment when I came face to face with that anger and wasn't mine. That had been my dad's that had been put into me. And 
that's who, because of Woody being with me, I was able to get in touch with that and, and start to be able to exercise or separate myself from that difficult emotion um, and put some context around it and learn some skills about how to manage it really, which took years. But um, he was that, you know, Taoist accepting presence that allowed me to explore the depths of, of healing wherever it took me. Had you ever had, say, more traditional therapy with a therapist to, to look at some of these issues, or was it, that was the first time? Yeah, no, I had. This was all self done so far. Um, he was my first um, dog psychologist. I didn't even know there was such a thing that that a person would do. That became apparent to me um, later on, actually, when a counselor kind of confronted me at a in a business where I was. But um, no, this was all dog as primal therapist. <laughs> so this concept of dog as therapist or psychologist is pretty pretty interesting, so much so that you did a radio show up in Alaska <laughs> with, with Woody yeah. as, or, or with this persona of, of a dog psychologist and a podcast. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, it, it was a show called Chew the Bone with Dr. Woody. And Dr. Woody was a renowned cosmic dog shrink who answered the letters from troubled pets or the two leggeds who live with them. And so this was on, um, went over the community radio and stuff for a year and a half or something like that. So he became the most, um, most famous dog in Ketchikan, Alaska. So when I wrote the book, I decided it was time for the, you know, the second coming of Dr. Woody. <laughs> and he, he's answered some pretty interesting questions over the years. We're, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you uh, share with us and, and give our listeners a little tidbit about what Dr. Woody sounds like and the types of things he talks about? Well, uh, I have to admit something in public here for the first time. I, I have to channel Dr. Woody for him to come into the world. Okay. Um, and no one's ever seen this before, but. This is the first here on Dog Podcast Network. Yeah, so he would, um, good evening, all you mutts and pretty girls too. This is Dr. Woody. <laughs> so that that's kind of how Dr. Woody comes through, you know. I like that. And then, and so I can again see a corollary between Oreo and Dr. Woody in terms of your imagination pulling these dogs that have great meaning. I never put that together. Never even thought that through. Um, but, you know, really even speaking through this, I mean, I never... Now I'd say, yeah, Oreo was a therapy dog, even though it wasn't, right. you know, real. It sure was to the child. And so I guess, you know, the other part of the story is I'm transitioning from being an accountant into being an artist. I'm trying out public radio and theater and um, writing and filmmaking and all these stuff. So I guess... I went into the fun of creativity and took this whole do this whole idea of you know what dogs have to teach us um, into Dr. Woody and Dr. Woody's primary you know belief system um, or orientation of practice is that uh, dogs are angels here to um, help the two legged and that they are mirrors to uh, higher consciousness. Well, let's talk a little bit about this right brain, left brain transition from being an accountant to being a creative soul. And when we say creative, I mean a lot of things. It's not just the radio show, movies, books, short stories. You really have embraced that side of you, thanks to Woody. Yeah, and 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 thanks for, you know, been a while since I thought of left brain, right brain, but okay, so now I've seen this side of me that has become in the world. And then to crunch that, you know, to go back and put that into that Boxtown suited characters, left brain world, um, you know, and try to press it into that box. Mm. Um, that became the rite of passage that I talked about, uh, as well as the healing movement that moving from that linear world of of facts and straight lines um into a more nonlinear world i think the bridge there too was that i i went to work in a native alaskan village for 7 years 
and started to work with Clinkit people in originally as an accountant and then transitioned into working with their um, culture. And that was taking me more into a uh, right brain place. Yeah, definitely. And they adopted you. They gave you, uh, they gave you your own moniker. <laughs> yeah, they did. What did they call they you? They did. They gave me, they gave me a, a sealskin vest and gave me the name Ganya, which uh, meant to the, in their language, a woodpecker or beaver, because they thought I was a hard worker. <laughs> ah, okay. And so let's talk about some of these more grand creative projects that you have found yourself in. You know, can can that one thing other? Can I say this and then sure. then come back to that? And I just want to say that um, while at the native village, I came to understand why I was in the three piece suit. And that is that a um, counselor that watched me at a, at a board meeting, uh, a counselor from out of town and saw me experiencing this board meeting that blew up and got all very emotional. And afterwards I went over to him and he said, can I ask you something? And I said, what? And he says, which one of your parents was an alcoholic? And I said, well, I don't know. I didn't really you know, affect me that much. He says, well, that's the second sign and laughed. And I said, well, you know, who are you? You know, all this. And I said, it just, it wasn't that bad. And he says, well, that's, um, that's the third sign, you know, you (laughs) think it wasn't that bad. But what he taught me in working with him is that a lot of kids that had alcoholic backgrounds, parents, kids of alcoholic parents, and tend towards the toward the more um, linear careers, accounting, finance, engineering, whatever. And that's because we find that a safe environment. We know where the rules were. So I kind of got it. Like it was actually the trauma of being in an uncontrollable world that liked accounting and liked being in a suit. And it was like, I actually know the rules here, <laughs> you know, and it had rigid guidelines and, and I mean, you absolutely generally accepted accounting procedures. You, <laughs> Principles. Yeah, that's it. This is the way you do it. You do accounting yeah. in ink, not pencil. <laughs> right. Right. And so I, I think that that then allowed me to begin to expand out until those, you know, buttons of the suit popped and I couldn't wear those anymore. When's the last time you had a, a three-piece suit? A suit. <laughs> I, I actually wear suits now for fun. I'm a tango dancer, so uh-huh. I, I like I like right. dressing up for. for but they're fun a little more and, glittery. And, I think they're a little more. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, feel, I don't think you can right. get away with that at one of the big eight firms. Yeah. Ward, let's take a break right here. We will be back with more of this conversation. And now a message from your dog. Oh, every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I wonder. Mm, many beach days as possible. Oh, I want to run. I want to sniff. Ooh, I want to find a good stick to carry. Oh, I want to roll in the grass. Oh, and warm my belly in the sun. Oh, I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pop. The green, glassy beef liver smell wakes my senses. Oh, you may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy. <laughs> it infuses any food you give me with healthy life vibrancy. Oh, <laughs> I can feel it. Ever pop traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. I'm so grateful to be your dog. And for the ever pop you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. Welcome back to The Long Leash. So let's talk about some of these creative expressions where you you turn in the uh, Lotus one, two, three, or whatever it was back then and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and picked up some other creative uh, tools. Yeah, I think the primary one really is filmmaking. Um, 
And my first film was called The Heart of the Game. And that ended up, uh, it was really a group about a group of kick-ass high school basketball players in Seattle, but ended up Miramax picked it up um, at the Toronto Film Festival. And it just blew up my life in a good way. And so that made, gave me the um, capacity to just be a filmmaker. And so since then I've, um, I'm on my fourth long feature now that we're doing, and there's been that 90 shorts along the way too. That's, so that's been the principal craft, you know, that's floated me to this point. And you worked with Paul Allen's uh, Vulcan. Yeah, Ventures. we did 50 films for Paul Allen, uh, really for education reform. Uh, they were um, educational films um, for high school and middle school teachers. And I'll just say the, uh, you know, we just did uh, finished a film called The Bow Makers, which is about, you know, the most famous instrument you've never heard of, you know, which is about the bow and the violin. Because I live in this small town where five of the world's most renowned um, world renowned bow makers live. And so that's a film about that, you know, and anyway, I won't go into each one. So in addition to filmmaking, what are some of the other creative expressions that you have found? Thanks to Woody. Um, b- back to radio, radio, community radio is, is something that I think is one of the greatest forms of democracy that still is around. Um, so I, I love radio. I do a music show called Word Songs, which is good lyrics, no matter the style. I, um, I'm i a dance teacher. I dance. A f- I teach a form called Soul Motion, which is about uh, mindful movement. And then writing. And writing has been revelatory. Um, and this is my first book. And I, I'm just fascinated with the difference between how a book is received in the world versus a movie because a movie is a collective experience where it's my images and and sounds up on the screen and the audience is having a collective experience but this book goes out and everyone is their own independent like movie house in their head you know and so i hear back from you know, a few people here, a few people there, and it's just trickling out around the world. And it's just intriguing how different parts of the book are touching people. Do you prefer one medium to another? No, I, I, I mean, the most satisfying is filmmaking. There's nothing like being in a theater um, and being in the back of the theater and having that on the big screen and just feeling that kind of entrainment where an audience is is hooked in and taking the story that I'm trying to tell. Uh, that's that's pretty good. <laughs> and when you released the book, or I guess it was a film, it, it took you on an international tour to, among other places, Thailand, where you met the person you ended up marrying. Yeah, Sophie. Yeah, that, that was true. Um, um, went over to Thailand telling people before I went that I'm going to go over and find myself a wife, you know, just joking, but (laughs) that's what happened. (laughs) Very powerful. And it's because of, that's because of her. I, I have a a yellow lab in our, in our house now named, named Dolly, who's, um, um, Sophie went to see, and I went to see this film called, um, Tracks, which is a story of this, a woman in Australia that walked across the country solo with her dog. And Sophie, didn't have dogs growing up. And so she saw an example of what it's like for a woman to be with a dog. And she came home and says, we're going to get a dog. And she, you know, went on the internet and said, here's our dog. And it was, it was Dolly. So that's how that came to be. Wow. So I'm assuming since Woody was named after Woody Guthrie, does that mean Dolly is named after Dolly Parton? You got it. Uh, All our animals were named after uh, women musicians. We had a cat named Mavis Staples and we had four chickens that were named after, um, like there was Emmy Lou Harris and, and Bonnie Raitt and Ella Fitzgerald. And then a skinny white one, um, we called Patty Smith. Since then we've got a, uh, four black chickens and they're Gladys Knight and the Pips because I can't keep them apart. Well, I imagine with, with all these famous female musicians around you, it's, it's tough. It's tough, Ward. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I feel pretty diminished. So something struck me when I was uh, doing some research, I read that you came back from Alaska and I think uh, uh, to take care of your parents, your mom and dad, right? Yeah. They were both in their last chapter of their life. And so 
it felt right to come back and be with them and um, continue the healing process with both of them. And that was really essential for me to be with them in that during that last chapter for both of them. And and you say uh, on your website that you shepherd them home and P.S. death is not the end. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, that's true. Anyone who's loved has discovered and through the loss of that love that something continues on and something continues on that the love continues on even though the form is gone you're a deep thinker ward <laughs> i don't know this is this is what you know too many too many winters in you know 13 feet of rain in alaska will do for you you know <laughs> with a dog um what is next for you uh well two films um that i'm working on now a documentary and i'm about to make my first um fictional film um that we're going to film next spring if we can next late spring are these big budget productions or no well you know documentary is is not i don't there i'm usually in kind of the half a million dollar range mm-hmm. on the doc side and the you know fictional film which is a short <laughs> it's definitely not big budget it's small budget and i'm not known as a director that can direct actors but i think i'm going to take to it like a duck takes to water cuz i did used to act in the theater i've studied directing and acting and i just i'm ready to try a new form of the medium so how do dogs continue or i won't, i'm not even going to presume that does dolly parton is she your muse now I would say not a muse. I would say, again, the thing that's consistent is, you know, dog is mirror. And what does she mirror to me? She's the most sensitive creature I've ever been around. And she has taught me and is teaching me how sensitive a creature might be to sounds, to what's going on around her and around me. And, you know, if, if just the slightest bit of crossness is in my voice, she'll like, you know, dip her head down and look away, you know, and I'll have to go, you know, sometimes say I'm sorry to her and stuff. And, and just that part of, you know, having such a sensitive dog has been really um, valuable to me to learn how to be a more sensitive human. And I think last on that, is that she's also taught me how deep trauma is in the body and how long it takes to heal because she was abandoned and abused for the first six months of her existence and so never got socialized and never had a kind moment. So even now, after being with her for seven years, you know, I'll I'll touch her. And if she's not aware I'm there, her whole body jumps, you know, and it's taken years and years of, of touch and me, you know, calming her central nervous system down. So I guess it's pretty amazing path, isn't it? When I think about it now that Woody was this lens through or vehicle through which I learned to touch other creatures and that that healed me eventually his presence and here i am helping to heal dolly through the presence of touch you know the cycle of life and it and uh (laughs) dogs are constantly giving and taking and and you're a part of that process ward serral thank you so much for being with us today i really appreciate it jim it's been a real kick and thanks so much keep up the wonderful dog work we reached back out to ward to see what he's up to these days He says he is still enjoying his now eight-year-old lab, Dolly, and he continues to do readings from To Crack the World Open. He's also creating his fourth feature documentary, Dancing with the Dead, Red Pine, and the Art of Translation. That movie is due to be released in 2023, and you can learn more about the film at redpinemovie.com. Well, that is all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you have an extraordinary story about how a dog changed your life, we'd love to hear about it. You can get in touch on our website at longleashshow.com. 
That's where you will find also our entire back catalog of programs, as well as links to get us in your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube. If you're looking for other dog-related content, check out our other shows at dogpodcastnetwork.com, including our flagship show, which is called Dog Edition. We did an episode a while back with Ward on Dog Edition that is called Dogs as Healers. There is a link to that in the show notes for today's program. I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha.